Hello and welcome to Lesson 32 of our course on Church History, Christ Church Through the Ages. Uh, today we are covering Part 2 on the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, we, of course, covered Part 1, the previous lesson, Lesson 31, uh, an introductory lesson to the Council itself, where we looked at uh, some of the historical details uh, of when the Council occurred, where it occurred, and under whom. We touched, uh, gave a bit of a background on some of the uh, historical and particularly theological issues leading into the council itself, particularly and especially following the death of uh, Cyril of Alexandria in AD 444, uh, and then uh, laid the foundation, just a brief uh, snapshot of uh, to get an understanding of the primary issue that this council was dealing with, uh, the heresy which we now know as Eutychianism, named after the uh, a monk of Constantinople, Evtichos, right, or Eutyches in English, uh, who had formulated what we call now in broader theological terms a monophysite uh, Christology. Um, and so today we're wanting to address, we mentioned this in the previous lesson, we're wanting to address and actually go through the uh, most significant byproduct of this council, which is actually called the Chalcedonian Creed. Um, and we'll read through it and go through it. Um, uh, not a, a you know terribly lengthy creed, um, but has some complexities uh, uh, to it that we'll be, that we'll be able to actually uh, see and have unfold for us um, and understand. Uh, as we get to the end of it uh, of this creed, and by the time we finish it, you'll hopefully have an appreciation for uh, how much uh, work kind of went into this creed. Uh, from the Chalcedonian fathers themselves, uh, as well as how careful and particular they were with with their wording. Uh, we've seen many, many times uh, throughout our, our lessons here in church history, particularly uh, when we focus on the, on the ecumenical councils themselves, how important words can be. Uh, we've seen how important uh, the not only the etymologies, but also the semantic usages of certain words can become where really the Arian heresy, uh, as we were looking at uh, the first two ecumenical councils, can be boiled down to a war over the meaning of even just one single word, monogenes, right, or monogenes, the, uh, the only begotten. And the one simple misunderstanding, uh, alteration, uh, abuse, twisting, whatever word you'd like to use, of that, of that simple Greek word monogenes, um, by Arius and his followers, uh, gave rise to the entire Arian heresy, which would plague the church for the better part of two to three hundred years. Um, in these similar cases, again, similar wording, we, we touched on that seminal uh, phrase or that seminal sentence from one of the letters of Cyril of Alexandria, wherein he writes concerning the Christ as one physis of God, the Logos incarnate. Um, to get some more context on that, please go back and look at that previous lesson, lesson 31, uh, the Council of Chalcedon, part one, where a lot of that was explained regarding what words Cyril of Alexandria used, what he actually probably meant by the broader from the broader context of his writings, as well as then how Eutyches himself kind of took that wording and and started to then actually apply it in heretical fashions. Um, those covered in the previous lesson uh, as well. Here today, focusing on the Chalcedonian Creed. Before we do, let us uh, just revisit uh, this particular graph that we actually. Uh, uh, looked at at the tail end of our previous lesson, um, and more is explained there. But this simple graph kind of gives a visual representation, at least, of of the Eutychian heresy, and of monophysite heresies more broadly. The two original natures of Christ, human nature and divine nature, are combined and confused and actually mingled into a brand new, unique nature. Um, now again, a more charitable reading of Eutyches' work uh, could lead one to uh, conclude that he was attempting to demonstrate the uniqueness of Christ. I made a point about that in the previous lesson about how you can make a, re a reasonable distinction between the 
intentions of Eutyches and the outcomes of Eutyches, uh, or if it's as a system, the intentions of Eutychianism and the outcomes of Eutychianism themselves. However, um, whilst that distinction can be made and whilst we can maybe be charitable to a degree with regards to Eutyches, the outcomes or the consequences of his theology are categorically heretical and have a disastrous effect upon the church um, for reasons that now in the Chalcedonian Creed itself, the Chalcedonian bishops, the Chalcedonian fathers are going to actually address and, and deal with herein. So let us now uh, begin our work through of the Chalcedonian Creed. As we read through this, there's there's a handful of just one or two, uh, a couple of um, points, uh, kind of that I interject, the kind of the simply uh, notes or annotations. Uh, you'll see them in parentheses. It's where I'm. It's where I'm adding that just simply for emphasis for you visually as you're sitting here learning. They're not. It's not the original wording of the creed. It's just simply to make a particular point as an explanatory note. Okay, so just to to make you aware of that. So, let us begin. We, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead, i.e. divinity, and also perfect in manhood. So, we, following on with the Holy Fathers, or following the Holy Fathers, in other words, following the, the, the faithful Orthodox uh, uh, bishops, having come before us at from their time period, Nicaea, Constantinople, and particularly Ephesus in their own context here in the 5th century, following on the Holy Fathers, right? they're showing that this is not just a brand new thing that we're kind of going out on a limb here, where we're actually, we are instead with those fathers. We are actually in the line with those, in line with those, uh, with those earlier church fathers, um, all with one consent, so a, a definitive declaration of affirmation of the work that has been done by those previous church fathers. We teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, They are very emphatically, even just in these first two lines here, definitively declaring that their teaching is this, of Christology is the same teaching of Christology that not only the fathers from the ecumenical councils, but really even more broadly by extension, the church fathers going all the way back into the Antonicene period, all the way back to the apostolic fathers themselves. Okay, and of course, consequently from there to the apostles and Christ Himself, they are they are trying to really heavily emphasise in this insipid in this opening, the uh, unity that they have in their teaching with the early church that has come in the four centuries prior to them, okay? Um, and they are, and they're, they're, they're right in this claim. Um, but that, that stressing of this unity in of teaching and of doctrine is something that's very, very important for them to communicate here right out of the gate. This one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the same perfect in Godhead, Godhead, again, which is an English translation here, We, we sometimes in the 21st century, we tend to think of Godhead as referring to the three persons of the Trinity, which is not necessarily inaccurate per se. The term Godhead historically in English actually is referring to the divine essence, right? Or the divine substance, okay? So the divine being, God himself. Uh, so, so really kind of the way that we use the term Godhead today is, is slightly different from a semantic perspective uh, with regards to how that term Godhead was used, say, in, in early modern English. Um, so the same perfect in divinity is what that kind of word is really actually meaning coming out of the Greek. Uh, the same perfect in divinity and also perfect in manhood. Okay, so perfect meaning complete, right, or having the fullness thereof. So perfectly divine, so fully divine, and also perfectly human, or a, 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 uh, totally or fully human, okay? Fully God, fully man, as we would say, fully divine and, and fully human. Following on from that, truly God and truly man, 
hence that phraseology, hence why you, you'll commonly hear me use this kind of terminology of truly God and truly man, or fully God and fully man. Again, those terms uh, are being used synonymously uh, and interchangeably in English. Of a logical soul and body. We've actually seen similar phraseology to that in some of the earlier councils as well. Uh, of course, the word logical coming from that that root, that most important root word, logos. So of a logical soul and body, um, uh, which was common phraseology in the Hellenistic world. Consubstantial, meaning coessential. Okay, so that, that obviously consubstantial is taking from the Latin influence there for us into English. Uh, the the word substantia, right, substance, okay, of the same substance. The Latin prefix con, meaning together or with, right, with the same substance or along the same substance, right. Sometimes phrased as co-essential, which again also has uh, Latin roots, essentia, right, meaning essence. From a theological perspective, in terms of its ecclesiastical usage, especially at a fundamental level, um, as we've explained in previous lessons on the ecumenical councils, especially around the, uh, the the Nicene Creed, the terms substance and essence we're using interchangeably here in English. Okay, So of the same substance or the same essence with the Father according to the Godhead, Okay, which is a point that's specifically addressed in the phraseology of the Nicene Creed itself. Okay, Consubstantial, Coessential with the same substance, i.e., the same essence, with the Father according to the Godhead, in other words, divinity, okay, and consubstantial, i.e., coessential, i.e., of the same substance slash essence, with us according to the manhood. So that's a very good formulaic way. If I just say it simply as the wording goes, consubstantial with the Father according to the divinity, and consubstantial with us according to the manhood. No? very clearly, again, what they're doing there, beginning this section, truly God and truly man, they then expound what they mean by that and expand upon what they mean by that. Of the same substance as the Father, according to his divinity, right, or Godhead, and of the same substance with us, humans, according to the manhood, i.e. humanity, in all things like us, yet without sin. And that's a, the kind of that... That phrase, simple phrase there is is really touching on that, that manhood element or the human element, okay? In all things like us, so just as human as we are, not some uh, different variation of human, not some superhuman that's completely different than I or you or Adam or the apostles or insert whichever human you want to talk about. In all things like us, truly human, Yet the only point of distinction being that he was without sin, okay? He was not, uh, he did not bear in his humanity the curse of original sin, okay? Which, again, has been touched on at various different times, um, but that is, by ver that is one of the necessary reasons why the uh, virgin birth was necessary, why the lack of a mortal human father from a biological perspective from a reproductive perspective was important the curse of original sin when considering the whole counsel of god is passed down through the federal head through the man in all things like us yet without sin okay so the unblemished lamb of god as the scriptures uh, symbolize and, and and prophesy of okay very good formulation explaining what they mean by truly God and truly man. But that is the central phrase. Again, this latter half of the text that you have on screen for you at the moment is really the expansion and the and the explanation of what they mean by that seminal phrase, truly God and truly man. Okay, True God, true man. Very important uh, wording that then kind of comes down to us thus far. So, continuing on. Begotten before all ages of the Father, according to the Godhead, i.e. divinity, and in the last days, for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, according to the manhood. Okay? So here again, some of the uh, more practical elements of the incarnation itself. 
uh, begotten, again, of that very uh, important and, and controversial word, as it turned out, uh, in and around the Arian heresy of the 4th century AD. Uh, of course, the word begotten becoming so fundamental and foundational to the work done at the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople, respectively. Begotten of all, sorry, pardon me, begotten before all ages of the Father. Okay, so in other words, he's eternal. Uh, a point uh, distinctly denied by Arianism. Begotten before all ages of the Father according to the divinity, because he's of the same substance. That was covered in the previous slide. And in the last days, okay, the last days of the old covenant is what that means uh, from an eschatological perspective, for us and for our salvation, so that's the purpose, right? God with us, uh, of course, the, the name of, of Jesus, uh, the one who's also called through Isaiah Iman and other prophets, Emmanuel, uh, uh, God will, for God will save his people, okay? For us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, that of course was the really the central kind of pragmatic theological issue uh, that was present at the Council of Ephesus. Uh, please, please see those previous lessons because the understanding of the Virgin Mary as the Theotokos, as the God-bearer or the mother of God, is actually an extremely vital issue for, for any and all Christians to understand. Unfortunately, due, due to, um, how to put this politely, due to uh, either misunderstandings, historical misunderstandings, or even just a general naivety or ignorance of church history, um, there are elements of, of evangelical or Protestant circles that reject the term based upon those misunderstandings or naiveties. Um, because it sounds, quote-unquote, too Roman Catholic um, or, or too Eastern Orthodox. Um, every Christian has an obligation to uphold the Virgin Mary as the Theotokos um, uh, in opposition to, uh, to Nestorius's teaching or the teaching of Nestorianism broadly that he, Christ, is only... Uh, sorry, pardon me, that the Virgin Mary is only the Christotokos, the Christ-bearer, uh, um, that... The consequences of that being that Christ himself uh, only became God at some later point. No, in the womb of the Virgin Mary, Christ himself was true, to use the wording of this Chalcedonian Creed, truly God and truly man. Mary bore God in her womb, in the humanity that is the person of Christ himself. Um born of the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos. Um, very, very important. But again, consult, consult those previous lessons of ours on the Council of Ephesus. According to the manhood, okay? So the humanity of Christ coming via his very uh, human and earthly mother, the Virgin Mary. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures. And before we jump into the word salad that, <laughs> that's about to come upon us, uh, let's just break down that little portion there for us. Um, he's one and the same Christ. Okay, it's not two different persons. So they're actually specifically addressing uh, Nestorianism here in this particular sentence. So whilst this is in the context, of course, of Eutychianism and Eutychian heresy, like we had pointed out, not only in the previous lesson, but also here in the introduction, this... Uh, issue of that was being dealt with here at the Council of, of Chalcedon was a follow-on from the issues that had already sprung up and were being kind of uh, first addressed at the Council of Ephesus 20 years prior in AD 431. So one and the same Christ, not radical diet, the radical diaphysitism of Nestorianism, where you actually have the Son of God and the Son of Man being two different persons, not just natures, persons. The Son of God is the divine person. The Son of Man is the human person. It's two natures constituting two persons as opposed to the orthodox biblical position, which is two natures, truly God, truly man, as this creed mentions, united in one hypostasis, one hypostatic union, one person, okay? 
one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, monogenes, only begotten, so they're picking up even a word going all the way back to the Council of Nicaea, to be acknowledged in two natures. Okay, So one person of Christ to be acknowledged in two natures. Now, here's where the wording becomes important for us. Inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. Parentheses, I've put them, put those words into a bit more of a simple formula for us in English. It's the exact same words. I'm not changing the words. I'm just simply rendering them in a more simple uh, formula for us in English. I.e., without confusion, change, division, or separation. Okay? CCDS uh, as a helpful acronym. Without confusion, change, division, or separation. Okay? Now, it's, this might seem, again, like a bit of a word salad, but there's actually some very, very intelligent uh, wording and phraseology going on here. This is actually a, a significant demonstration of their intellectual prowess and borderline genius, um, among these, some of these bishops at least. Um, without confusion, change, division, or separation. So, to understand where I'm going, Think of, the f think of the first two being coupled together or related to each other and the last two being coupled and related to each other, okay? Here's what I mean. Without confusion or change. Confusion in this context is what we might say otherwise in English as a mingling, okay? Uh, I use, uh, I've used the analogy before when discussing this subject of Eutychianism of uh, of ingredients going into a into a pan or into a pot to, to bake a particular food item like a cakes for example uh, you, you confuse the elements the substance the, the kind of initial substances the elements themselves uh, the flour the sugar the chocolate the whatever happens to be going into that particular uh, cake are original constituent elements in their own right it's sugar it's flour it's chocolate it's etc when they're then mixed together, whilst, of course, it has an element of uh, sugariness or an element of chocolatiness, to, uh, to use uh, not-so-great English, um, it's not just simply chocolate anymore. It's not distinctly chocolate anymore. It's not distinctly sugar anymore. It's not distinctly flour anymore, etc., etc., etc. The distinctness of those uh, requisite foundational elements are no longer actually distinct. Okay, this is what's meant by the word that we bring into English as confusion. Okay, without confusion, to confuse the two natures of Christ is to take the divine nature and the human nature and to mix them together into that new nature vis-a-vis -vis the the kind of graph that we looked at at the very beginning of today's lesson. Okay. What happens when you confuse the two initial substances, the two foundational substances, divine and human, is you necessarily and consequently change it. It is now no longer just distinctly a divine nature or distinctly a human nature. It, in fact, is now something new and unique. To use the cake analogy. When looking at a chocolate cake, as my analogy was working on, it's no longer just simply a piece of chocolate. And you cannot look at a chocolate cake and call it a piece of chocolate. You also can't just simply call it, call it a teaspoon of sugar, right? Or a bowl of flour, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is now something entirely new and consequently unique, a chocolate cake. In a similar fashion, when you confuse the two natures of Christ, the divine and the human, it inevitably, and here's the important part, necessarily results in a change of the nature. Notice I say nature singular because now it is one single nature, hence that graph. The human nature and the divine nature are confused together, i.e. mingled together, 
and the consequence is a new, unique, singular nature. It is neither distinctly human, nor is it distinctly divine, but a confusion or admixture of the two. So confusing the natures ends up changing them. That's how those first two words are linked. You can almost think of it as the first word is the act, and the second word is the consequence. So confusion is the act or the action, and then change is the consequence or the outcome. Similarly, the same relationship exists between the D and the S, the division and the separation. Without division is going in the opposite direction, which is now addressing Nestorianism. Okay, A division of the natures, a radical diaphysitism, as we would call it in theological terms, a radical division of those two natures, the human and the divine, which under Nestorianism as a, as a system or as a teaching, ends up constituting two persons, a human person and divine person existing in the one flesh, essentially the one body. That kind of division of the two natures results in a separation of the two natures. To the point, as I just mentioned with Nestorianism, where the separation is so distinct and so categorical that under Nestorian teaching, there's actually two persons as a result. That's how distinct and disparate the two natures under Nestorian teaching actually is. The two natures result, consequently, in two persons, a divine person and a human person, the Son of God and the Son of Man. Okay? The Christ and Jesus, etc., 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 again, covered in previous lessons. So the division is the action, the separation is the consequence. So in four words here, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, and insepar or inseparably, i.e. in a more simple formula in English, without confusion, change, division, or separation, the first two words, confusion and change, directly refute Eutychianism, or monophysitism more broadly, and then the last two, the second, the last two words, division and separation, deal with radical diaphysitism, i.e. Nestorianism. So in those four words, action, consequence, action, consequence, conf without confusion, change, division, or separation, the Chalcedonian Fathers have provided a simple yet powerful and profound formula for addressing and dealing with and defeating both of the polar opposite ends of these heresies, namely Eutychianism and Nestorianism. And they conclude this particular section by saying, the distinction of the natures being by no means taken, take, taken away by the union. So in other words, the hypostatic union of the full divinity and full humanity of Christ that union, that, that hypostatic union, right, in no way uh, injures or eliminates the distinction of the natures, okay? Even though those two natures of Christ, the divinity and the humanity, are their own distinct natures, so the divine is not the human and the human is not the divine, their union in one hypostasis, one hypostatic union, one person, that union does not confuse and therefore change those natures. They remain distinct, not divided and therefore separated, but rather distinct in terms of a categorical definition. Okay? The distinction of the natures being by no means taken, so being by no means taken away by the union. Okay? He remains truly God in every meaning of the essence. He remains truly man in every meaning of the essence. And that true humanity and the true divinity are united without cha confusion, change, division, or separation in the one hypostasis of Christ, in the one person. Okay, Incredibly brilliant phraseology here on the part of 
these Chalcedonian bishops. It's uh, as someone who is standing here teaching <laughs> this creed, um, I cannot help but be in awe and admiration of uh, how much intellectual uh, rigor and effort goes into uh, succinctly, categorically uh, kind of formulating these very important words where even if one of these words in this, in this kind of subsection here were to be off, uh, A, the entire creed would probably fall apart, but B, and more importantly, it would only result in more false teaching and more heresy as a result. They have been so careful and so uh, calculated in their care for etymology and their care for semantics. Um, because the reality is, as we've seen so many times, I highlighted this in the last lesson, but as we've seen so many times throughout these ecumenical councils, uh, words matter <laughs> and wording matters. And, uh, and, the, and regardless of the intentions of how certain words get used, the consequences uh, can sometimes be dire and disastrous. Indeed, as we saw in that previous lesson, just focusing on this particular time period, the uh, perhaps well-intended but, but, but accidentally mistaken usage of the word physis by Cyril of Alexandria uh, gave rise to the Eutychian heresy itself. It was the very bedrock and foundation upon which Eutyches actually built his, uh, his theology, his heretical theology. Um, of course, not within the purview of what Cyril of Alexandria was intending, I'm sure, of course, uh, as, as a staunch defender of orthodoxy against uh, Nestorianism back at the Council of Ephesus. Um, but alas, this is why important uh, words are so important and why the meaning and usage, so etymology and semantics, of words uh, are so, con so consequential uh, in not only our own lives, but in the life of the church more broadly, because entire historical crises like this one can spring up based on how even singular words get understood or used. So let's continue off to finish off this creed here today. But rather, the property of each nature being preserved, so following on from that previous uh, uh, sentence there with the distinction of the natures uh, by no means taken away by the union, now for us on this slide, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring, in other words, occurring at the same time, in one person and one subsistence. By subsistence here, again, explanatory note, meaning uh, being or existence. Okay, So there's not two persons, there's only one person. There's not two existences, right? The, the divine existence and the human existence in two different persons, no one subsistence, one being, one existence, one, as we would say in English coming from the Latin persona, one person, okay? The property of each nature being preserved, right? So no, no confusion, no change, no division, no separation, vis-a-vis -vis the previous phraseology from the last slide. The property, so in other words, the inherent characteristics of the substance of the divine nature, and also likewise at the same time for the human nature, being preserved and concurring, occurring at the same time, in one person and one being or one existence. Okay, One person, not two. Not parted or divided into two persons, hence the Nestorian teaching, but one and the same son, the only begotten, monogenes, God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, similar to what they did earlier on in the creed, back on the very first slide, um, where they said they're one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten. Similar phraseology here. The one and the same Son and only begotten. God the Word, right, the Logos, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? The divine Jesus Christ, God himself. Then they finish here with a with a conclusionary remark, uh, which is which is threefold in nature to tripartite uh, conclusion, to really re-emphasize 
and establish once again uh, a very similar concept, essentially the same concept that they began this creed with in the incipit, right? It serves here these last uh, these last three phrases, these last three clauses, as a bookend and a counterpart to the very beginning of this creed. As the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. So, again, threefold or tripartite in nature. Clause one, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, right? so all the Old Testament, in other words, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, so the Gospels plus the apostolic epistles of the New Testament, because, of course, the apostles received the teaching from Christ, and that's essentially what the apostolic epistles are. They are commentaries and explanations of the teachings of Christ from the Gospels, right? So Christ, having taught it and the apostles delivered it, that's the second clause. And then third and finally, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. So the creed that's in view there, of course, is the Nicene Creed, okay? So here, this is a very plenary explanation of the basis of the theology of this entire creed. And it's a brilliant way that they phrase it here. The prophets, clause one, Christ and the, slash the apostles, by extension, clause two, and then the church fathers, clause three. So in other words, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and church history. Holy Scripture and the tradition and history of the church all summarized there in these three final closing clauses uh, that serve as the conclusion to this brilliant work that is the Chalcedonian Creed, right? So it's not just merely a private interpretation of what those prophets mean, nor is it just merely uh, subjective opinion as to what they think Jesus Christ said uh, or his apostles, but including also the way or the manner the substance by which and in which uh, the church fathers, the holy fathers, have understood that, especially as formulated in the creed itself, okay? Especially concerning such an important and vital subject of Christology, which is what this is uh, primarily and specifically addressing, okay? The Old Testament, the New Testament, and the history, and church history itself, right? Brilliant formulation as a conclusionary remark uh, that bookends reflecting the very same, uh, the insipid in the beginning of this particular creed. So, that uh, therein ends our lesson, Lesson 32, which is on the Council of Chalcedon Part 2, where we've looked specifically at the Chalcedonian Creed. Uh, it'll be valuable for you to read through this creed uh, again and again, um, uh, listen to this lesson as well uh, as needed. Um, the wording of this particular creed, much like with its uh, primary predecessor, the Nicene Creed, uh, is the product of, um, of quite frankly, brilliant men. Uh, it, is the it is the product of, uh, of faithful men. It is the product of, of loyal and passionate men. Uh, the bishops herein assembled at uh, the Council of Chalcedon, um, quite frankly, by the grace of God and the guidance of His Holy Spirit, produced a remarkable work. Um, uh, this creed is formulated in, in such a particular and specific way, uh, demonstrating very clearly the incredible depth and profundity of, of care uh, and of a forethought and of planning and of consensus then brought through based on their study of the scriptures. Uh, and again, as they're working through actually formulating this particular creed uh, when you go through the, the, the various and voluminous writings of, of that come out of the Council of Chalcedon, they are working heavily and intimately with the scriptures, which is why they're able to say in that conclusion that they are declaring this in, in, instead and, and in, in alignment and conformity with the prophets of old, with Christ and the apostles, and with the history of, of the Church Fathers, of the Holy Fathers. Um, and they are right, and they are true uh, when they say that. Um, the Chalcedonian Creed stands as uh, a vital pillar of theology in the history of the Church, 
Uh, it is uh, an extremely essential uh, document um, in the history of, of Christianity uh, and really should be something that should be uh, significantly and deeply studied by, by any and all Christians uh, in our time. Um, it is really the one of, if not potentially even, the defining work on Christology specifically. Okay, uh, The Nicene Creed really is addressing more than just Christology. It's a, it's a Trinitarian document, ultimately, at large. Um, and so it's addressing the, the broader... Uh, pillars uh, and articles of the church uh, in terms of its its basic theology um, uh, and of course hence why it's so historically popular um, and rightfully so in this case the Chalcedonian Creed is really dialing in on on the subject of Christology and the Chalcedonian Creed serves as the defining creedal statement of the church concerning Christology if you ever want to learn and understand with true depth and meaning who is Jesus Christ from a metaphysical perspective, the Chalcedonian Creed is uh, is the place that you turn to. So, thank you for joining us here in Lesson 32 on the Council of Chalcedon, Part 2.